Hi, it's Alex from LaughingPlace.com here today with Brian Volk Weiss, director of Behind the Attraction, coming to Disney Plus on July 21st. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I was curious to know how did um, how did you get involved in Behind the Attractions? Um, what what was your Disney fandom level like leading up to this? So, I mean, I felt. I thought I had like a master's degree heading towards uh, a PhD uh, of my Disney knowledge. Like I'm the guy that like the first time I went to Kansas City in my life, like everybody was going to try the brisket and the beef and everything. And I like hunted down where the original, you know, where Walt and Roy had their original studio. Like that was me in fact, the meeting where Behind the Attraction got greenlit, uh, I brought a picture that I had taken of the original studio. And, and I wanna stress, I did not tear it off the wall, but I did find a piece of brick that had fallen off, a bigger piece of brick. And I had took that and I had glued it to the same frame that had that picture in it. Wow. And I, that had been on my wall for about 12 years. I brought that to the green light meeting, which is sort of a big no-no. Like you're not <laughs> supposed to bring like, you know, fun things to pitches. But I, you know, it, listen, I will be very honest with you. And this may be a crazy thing for, for, to, to say or hear. The entire time we were making the show, looking back on making the show, talking to you now, I will say to you as though I'm saying the sky is blue. I cannot believe the show was greenlit. Like it was, I, I, I mean, I cannot, like we, like anyway, getting back to your question, sorry to be rambling, but like- No, no, go ahead. I thought I had a master's. I now realize I had like a first degree education. Like I didn't get it. So, we, they gave, they basically on-ramped us into how they work. So, I mean, we were being shown things that like the public probably won't see for another 10 years. Many things we saw have just been announced in the last couple of weeks. Like that lightsaber, mm -hmm. Spider-Man jumping around. Like <laughs> we've known about that for a long time. So yeah. like, that's what it was like making the show. Looking at the 10, uh, the list of 10 episodes and the titles of them, um, how do you define the word attraction? I mean, I know other companies say ride, Disney says attraction, and some people swap attraction for ride. So what's your, what's your definition of attraction for the, the title of the show? It's a great question. We defined it in a, the broadest sense possible as, which, so I mean, that was, that was strategy one, make it broad. Stress. And so, I mean, that's basically the answer, but to get into the detail of it, the idea was anything the public could or would interact with where we felt there would be a surprise. Like when people see the episode list and they're like, there's an episode about hotels? Like that's by design because you don't think, how is Disney, like what people don't understand about the past is Disney's hotels are direct, like all modern hotels on the planet are based on what they learned that Disney figured out when they opened their first hotel in Anaheim. Yeah. But what Disney's doing now, like with Star Wars and everything like that, it you may not have said to yourself, oh boy, one day I hope there's something called Disney Plus. And if there's something called Disney Plus, I hope they make a show about the attractions. And if they make a show about the attractions, I hope they do an episode on hotels. Nobody would ever think to do that. But hopefully they'll watch the episode and be like, I was skeptical. This is one of my favorite episodes. Well, and I'll just say you're kind of a, a king of, um, I gotta hold it here or that it disappears, but you're kind of a king of doing shows that you know people wouldn't expect. Um, I love the toys that made us um, every episode, even, even toys that I was never um, participatory in, I found very fascinating. 
Um, so I imagine, I, I know the history of the Disneyland Hotel, but for anybody watching who doesn't, um, I'm sure they're in for some wild times and just the evolution of that experience since it opened in 55 is um, pretty incredible. Um, now, how did you settle on those 10 themes? What was what were those conversations like? And was, was there anything you wanted that they couldn't do that Disney said, no, um, not this time? There was nothing we wanted to do where Disney said, no, we don't want you doing that. But I, I mean, again, this is such a cliched answer, but I, you don't know me, but I swear to you, like, this is the truth. The, the, the problem was, it was like going to the greatest buffet in Vegas. Like, even if I starve myself for two days, there is a finite amount of snow crab legs I can eat. So the idea of what we tried to do was we tried to create a balance of kind of like, of course, if you're gonna do a series about this, you're gonna cover Space Mountain. But we also tried to pepper in there stuff where, because to me, as a filmmaker, it's about earning the audience's trust. And you need to earn their trust again and again and again. If you think, oh, that other show was a hit, they better just trust me on this, that ain't gonna work. I am also a member of the public. Like, I'm not just a director. So I am 99.99999% of my life a consumer of content. We tried to create a, a, a list that would make, like, obviously, if we only did episodes like Space Mountain, we probably couldn't do more than three seasons. And if we only did episodes like, you know, trains, trams, and monorails, there probably would definitely not be a season two. So we tried to create this mix. So it's like, if you trusted us and you liked what you saw about Space Mountain and Haunted Mansion, give us the benefit of the doubt and check out hotels. And then theoretically, they would like what we did. And then from that point on, watch anything we gave them. That's the theory. We'll see what happens, but that's the theory. Why was Paget Brewster the right choice to be the narrator of Behind the Attraction? Um, I think there is no more important job within reason that I have other than picking the right narrator. And it comes down to two things. There's the actual voice. Like you want a voice that fits the, the show that you're making, but you also, you need somebody that has a personality that's in sync with the show. So to me, this show is a lot of fun. There's a lot of humor and there's a lot of heart. And when I first met Paget, when we were auditioning people, you know, I had already heard her lines in her audition, but I wanted to get a sense of her. And she's fun loving, she's really smart, and she's got a lot of heart. And that's, it, it, was, it was a no brainer after we met. I was curious to know, um, timeline wise, you know, filming, editing, um, when, when was the show in production compared to uh, pandemic and how long would you say the editing take? Cause it's, it's a pretty elaborately edited series. There's, there's um, you know, a lot of tricky editing going on. Yeah, I, uh, I knew when I got on the plane in Charles de Gaulle to fly back to L.A. Uh, that uh, the United States was going to be shut down. I mean, there, there were already masks. Like, it, it, was, it was getting bad. And I'll be honest with you, man, I, I, think, I think some of our crew had COVID, um, uh, like, while we were traveling on the way back. Like in retrospect, I mean, none of us know for sure, but that's how close we were to the, uh, to the, to the edge of the crisis. Um, and then, I mean, we basically edited for another eight months uh, after we wrapped, uh, and, but all remotely. Yeah, that's a, a, a stressful timeline, it sounds like. Um, now in the show, you interview a lot of Imagineers. It looks like it's in their offices and they have, um, you know, lots of stuff on the wall. I can only imagine a lot of Disney fans are going to be pausing and, and starting and stopping the series to try and take in, like, is that an animatronic face and which one is it um, without the, you know, the mechanics behind it? Um, 
were there, I guess, like moments where you went for an interview and, and someone was there saying like, oh, you have to take these things off your shelf. We can't show this. Like, how did you, how did you manage the, the, what could be seen in frame for a lot of these Imagineer interviews? So we had at least one uh, yellow shoe with us everywhere. And they would look at everything and make sure, I don't think we messed up. I, I hate to disappoint the fans, but uh, it was meticulously uh, scru uh, scrubbed over. But I'll tell you this, one of my favorite moments, man, we're in a, we're in a conference room and uh, we're in a big meeting. This is very early on. And the guy talking, we'd already been in there for about 20 minutes. The guy talking, He's talking to me, but over the course of talking to me, I can see him starting to look behind me more and more with increasing like urgency and like fear. And then he was like, excuse me for a second, literally got up, ran into the board. And like, before I could even turn around and see what was there, it was like, <laughs> like, yeah. So that, that was probably the closest call, but, um, that was not filmed. Last question I wanted to ask was just about the, the Jungle Cruise connection. Obviously the, the Dwayne Johnson, Emily Blunt film is coming out this summer. Um, it's kind of timed with the release of Behind the Attractions and you have Dwayne Johnson as a producer. Um, so specifically on the Jungle Cruise episode, what was kind of the most interesting thing um, that you learned or discovered um, in that process? All of this happened because it started with Toys That Made Us. Dwayne mm -hmm. saw toys Mm. And I'll never forget this, man. I was at LAX at 5.15 in the morning going through security when I got a text from the head of our accounting department. And I, like, I'm, it was the worst timing ever because I was just putting my stuff on the, on the tray. And for about three minutes, I had to be like, why is my head of accounting texting me at five? Like, did someone steal all our money? Like, it was, it was not fun. Once I go through security, I get my phone. She had screenshotted a picture of The Rock's post. The next day, Brian uh, Gewertz from his company called me. That's how this all started. So to answer your question, to pick one of my favorite things that I learned, I, I don't know why I found this so interesting. I loved in particular, because this phenomenon applied to a million things, but in particular, watching Roy and the Imagineers figure out what could be done differently in Orlando versus Anaheim. That to me is one of my favorite parts of the whole story. Because as I'm sure you know, the original Jungle Cruise, like they were going up to people's houses and asking to buy trees from their backyards. Like they were, they, they, they were taking dirt from the berm and like rather than throwing it out, building a ride with it. Like that was Anaheim when it opened. But when they were doing Disney World, A, they didn't have to build like that anymore. They could order trees from wherever they wanted. Like they had luxuries. And the main luxury again, as I know you know, is a hell of a lot more space. So the blessing of size. Yes. So <laughs> like, and I'll be honest with you, I had never done I've been to Orlando a billion times. I had never done the jungle cruise in Orlando. I'd only done mm. it in Anaheim. So we finally made it to Shirley's Temple. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that that was probably my favorite takeaway was like in Anaheim they did this, in Orlando they did that. And we get into that in the episode quite a bit. It's a fascinating history of that attraction. Um, very much looking forward to it. Thank you again uh, for your time, Brian. And everybody, you can catch Behind the Attractions only on Disney+. Plus. The premiere date is now Wednesday, July 21st. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye.